If you're familiar with the story, The Little Prince, then you will recognize this drawing. What do you see? The child in the story draws this picture and when he shows an adult what he's drawn, the adult says, that's a nice hat. It's not a hat, the prince explains. It's a snake that swallowed an elephant. The prince found it absurd that the adult saw only a hat. My name's Sarah Rask and I'm a consultant here at Rainbow Resource Center. The story of the little prince and his drawing may be why we parents are supposed to say, oh, look at that. Tell me about your picture instead of, that's a nice hat. How many of you have something at home that you made as a child? Maybe an ornament you made for the tree or something you drew for school, a clay something or other? Don't think this is art. Think again. When you look at those little creations, does it bring up a memory or an emotion? Would you feel sad if it were lost or broken? Art evokes an emotional response. Recently, I put a question on Rainbow's Facebook page. It read, as a kid, did you like to do art or was it more of a nuisance for you? Not a scientific study, mind you, but can you guess what sort of feedback we got? About 90% of those responded had good memories of making art as a child. The more negative responses had to do with feeling like they weren't good at it than anything else. Is it really all about right brain and left brain? Are all left brain kids good at math and all right brain kids good at art? Which one are you? Do you see these tendencies in your kids? Do you teach them according to their tendencies or to yours? I realize I'm asking a lot of questions here and I want you to be thoughtful and truthful in your answers throughout this workshop. I just want you to think about how you feel about art and maybe why you feel that way. Many children are natural artists. They're also very creative little thinkers. They scribble and draw and cut and glue their little hearts out. Starting at a very young age, kids will make you something and watch your reaction as you gush about how wonderful their little works of art are. Is this where the artsy vein comes from? So why does it stop or at least slow down as kids get older? Are we as parents gushing less? On the other side of that coin are children who seem uncomfortable when they're asked to produce art. They can follow directions to a T when asked to create something, and the results are often quite perfect. But if you were to ask them to come up with a product without explicit directions, they may be at a loss. Perhaps they are perfectionist and get frustrated when their product does not meet their own high standards. It can actually inhibit their learning if these kids are asked to do something artsy. So be gentle with your artistic demands of these kiddos. They may be doing the best they can and drawing a house and a tree and stick people, and this is their art. So be encouraging and supportive and ask them to tell you about their creation. Don't be the parent who says, nice hat, kid. If you're naturally an artsy person, then you'll easily recognize an opportunity to explore your child's creativity in your homeschooling day. You can work art into any subject, from history to math. You may not even think of your idea as art time, just as activities or projects. So how is a not so artsy parent supposed to recognize these opportunities? And why would you care about art when you're focused on math? I mean, isn't the idea of a math lesson to learn math? Teaching your child to think creatively is as important as teaching them to think logically and critically. It's all part of problem solving, isn't it? Look down the road at their high school career and how often they'll have to come up with original concepts in middle and high school. Anything from making a science presentation to writing an essay. In college and in their career, they'll be called on to think outside the box. Critical thinking often requires creativity. It's not just for the art major. Engineers think creatively in their problem solving all the time. Learning to make art and appreciate art is a cog in this process. In teaching your child about art and artists, you expose them to ideas and techniques they can apply to their own creation. It's like adding tools to their toolbox. Artful thinking leads to creative thinking, which leads to creative problem solving. 
Not all art has to be presented in art class. And this is what we're going to talk about in this workshop, creating an art full day. We're going to focus on the four core subjects, science, language arts, social studies, and math. I'll show you some products and talk about ideas you can actually do. I'm even going to tell you some specific artists and how you can relate them to your core subjects. Start small, maybe with one subject a year. Choose one that you're most comfortable teaching so it doesn't overtax your lesson planning. Say you choose social studies. Make an effort to bring art into your curriculum. This is a subject that easily lends itself to projects and artists. If you're wondering if crafts count as art, I'd have to say that it depends who you ask. Personally, I think that if you're creating something new out of materials that are lying around, that has as much intrinsic value as an oil painting on canvas. Another person may say that if you're following directions to make a product, like knitting a scarf for example, that's a craft and not real art. Art truly is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, look at some modern art out there, or folk art. There's no question of the value of these styles among art collectors. Keep in mind that what's really important is that your child is creating and thinking creatively throughout their life. We googled both art and craft to see what the web had to say about the difference. One word separated the two. Imagination. I asked around the rainbow office how people felt about art as a child. You know, another informal survey. One guy said he made a lot of models of planes and asked if that counted. I started asking him questions and wanted to see if he followed the directions or if he sort of did his own thing. His face lit up a bit and he said that while he started making them straight from the directions, he began altering this and that as he got better and then he had a lot of spare parts and what do you suppose he did? He made original planes. Nobody told him to. It wasn't in the directions anywhere. He just did it. One gal said she took art in high school thinking it was going to be an easy class. Turned out it was rather a challenge and she got to learn how to do things like make a leaded glass window. Guess who has that window still? Another lady said she would draw the same thing whenever she had to draw a picture. A house, a tree, flowers, and a sun. She said it felt strange to her to not be good at something and she didn't know why she had to draw pictures all the time. It wasn't that she didn't like to create, but the emotion connected to her drawing was rather disconcerting. She knits and sews and does beautiful work with a pattern. Is this still art? If she makes a scarf for someone and they feel happy to get it, doesn't that qualify her creation as a piece of art? She made this for me and I made her a pair of earrings. How cool is that? I don't know how to make this and I'm a self-proclaimed artsy girl. Not everything I'm suggesting would be considered high art. Some of it's crafty or recycling or just plain simple. Okay. The goal is to maintain your child's naturally creative tendencies or to draw them out of your little left brainer and cultivate them, all while encouraging creativity in subjects other than art class. If you want to take any notes, we'll go in this order. Science, language arts, social studies, math, and then I'm going to talk about some art curriculum. I'm also going to suggest artists that you can relate to the core subjects. I think once you get the hang of it, you'll be able to make connections to other artists in these areas. I would love it if the next time you saw a painting, you thought, I can use that in math. We're going to look at several art programs and talk about some differences between them to help you make some informed choices. Science. The kitchen is a fantastic laboratory for art to meet science. It's naturally a hands-on learning environment. Use this to your advantage in getting your students to think artfully. Most kids will enjoy the fact that their art is edible as they learn about science at the same time. I think the difference between just cooking and relating a kitchen project to science is in the work you do leading up to the activity and also in the discussions you have as you are creating. Here are some ideas. Make a layered cake or a salad to represent the Earth's strata. Talk about what each layer represents as you make the project with the kids. 
look at a picture in a book or online as your model, or you could have the kids make the project and present it to you as they explain what the layers are supposed to be. How about a human cell made of gelatin with candies in it? What would you use as a nucleus? How about the organelles? Of course, the gelatin is your cytoplasm. Have the kids talk about the parts of the cell as you're putting it all together, and then again, as you're taking it all apart. Make cookies and talk about how chemical bonds take place. Does the sugar dissolve and then harden again? Does it look like it did when you made the dough? What's different and why? What happened to the eggs? Then you can decorate it and eat it. Bake a yeast bread and talk about how it needs sugar to multiply and rise. Why do you let it rest? What happens if the dough doesn't rise? What caused that? Can you eat unleavened bread? So many interesting learning opportunities. Here's a fun and easy one for little kids. Using food coloring, make a glass each of red, blue, and yellow water. Provide additional glasses of clear water and a dropper. Add some drops of color to the clear and watch what happens when the colors mix. Then you can put a white carnation in a vase of this colored water for a couple of days and watch it change colors. Go on a nature walk and collect fall leaves. Use these items to make a collage type scarecrow character on poster sized paper. You can also roll the leaves in a way that makes them look like roses. Tape them up tight at the bottom and add a stick for a stem. I saw this one online and decided to try it before our pretty Illinois fall leaves were all dried up. Look at my results. How pretty is that? Make a birdhouse and let kids decorate it either with paints or attach items found on a nature walk. Create feeders for wildlife out of recyclables, like a milk jug, and hang them from a tree to observe animals preparing for the winter. Make planets out of balloons and paper mache or use foam balls. String them from a clothes hanger for a mobile. Stamp your kids' fingerprints on paper and look at the patterns. Talk about how no two fingerprints are alike. Have them look for similarities in their prints. Then you can add faces, arms, and legs and make little creatures and characters out of them. Nature craft paper can be used for making collages. Birds colored by number would relate to a nature walk. All about volcanoes earth science kit. Ed Emberley's complete fun print drawing book. Birds to paint and color. Flower bird housewood painting kit. When it comes to artists, think of Henri Matisse. When you're learning about plants, he has many abstract leaves in his work. There's a book called How Artists See Weather that includes a lot of impressionists like Claude Monet, who painted the same subject in different weather conditions. Kids can imitate Monet by placing dots of blue and yellow paint on a page, then stand back from it and observe how it reads green. George O'Keefe would be a great one to look at for flowers in detail. Grant Wood when you're learning about agriculture, farming. Contraptions catapult. Let kids build a simple machine with levers and talk about Leonardo da Vinci. Language arts. I want you to think of dramatic arts for this subject. Choose an author or a character from a novel and have your student create an interview as that character. This is a fun way to see if your child really understands the story and the character's point of view. Ask the character about choices and decisions they made in the story and see what your child comes up with. Have kids make puppets from socks or paper bags and act out a story. This takes the focus off of your child and they may say more than they would normally without that fear of making a mistake. You can make backgrounds from poster board and even videotape the performance to watch later. With a book you've read or reading, have kids draw what they imagine the characters look like. They could also make a collage using the same idea in some old magazines. Have kids talk about their choices. You could then look for images of that character and see if their idea is similar or different and talk about that. What if the main character of a story is an animal? Have kids do the same thing for the animal heroes. Both Beatrix Potter and Dr. Seuss illustrated their own stories. Ask your children to do the same. 
you can tie the subject of literature into an actual art lesson by using the scenes from a story when your child learns to paint or draw landscapes. Literature lends itself to study artists of a particular time period. So if you're reading something written in or about the 1950s, find an artist of that same period like Jackson Pollock, for instance, and learn about them and their work. Some products? Come look with me, exploring landscape art with children, how to draw faces, Master Puppet Theater, Shakespeare Finger Puppet Cards, Tales of Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny, Who Was Dr. Seuss, Horton Hatches the Egg, Billy and Blaze, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Color your own great paintings by women artists. When you're learning about women authors, make some comparisons. You can use Winslow Homer for the 1870s or Andy Warhol for the 1970s. Social studies. The opportunities in this subject are really varied. Anything from building a pyramid from graham crackers to a mud hut model made of Tootsie Rolls. Again, with the food, right? You can study national costumes and talk about fabrics and patterns and even recreate these in some form. Make your own globe from craft store materials like a styrofoam ball and tissue paper. Use scrapbook paper to make a map of the US. When you're talking about art, mark a map with a pin to show what country an artist is from. Attach the name or face of the artist to the pin with some tape. Talk about holidays in different cultures and make crafts representing these traditions. Compare these traditions with the ones your own family does. Where did these family traditions come from originally? Try some origami when you're studying Japan. There's a lot of precision in this and it's not a messy thing at all. Some products could be mapping the world with art videos. United States cookbook would be fun to map and eat. Draw famous faces like George Washington. Batiko is a kit for fabric printing. When it comes to artists, think of Gauguin when you're studying island formation or European colonization. Ansel Adams when looking at Western US or national parks. How about Leonardo da Vinci? There's a stained glass coloring book and another one called Genius Who Defined Renaissance. Great American artists for kids would be fun when you learn American history. 100 artists who shape world history, find one that's related to the history lesson you're studying. Albrecht Durer, when you're studying the Reformation. Norman Rockwell or Edward Hopper, when you're talking about the Great Depression or World War II in America. Frederick Remington, when learning of Native Americans and westward expansion. Math. So where is the connection between math and art? They seem to be polar opposites in our brains. You may not see it at first, but think about little kids using manipulatives. What comes in that kit you buy? Colorful counters that kids sort by color, a clock, and geometric shapes, among other things. Why not make some? Paint rocks with acrylic paints. These can be used for counting and sorting. You can take dried beans and a cotton swab, dab a dot of paint on each bean. Use different colors and you can sort them and count them. Recycle bottle caps from milk or juice to use as counters. I came up with these three in a week. These are fun. You could use them for tracing circles and all sorts of things. Create a map from a cereal box with patterns to place your counters in a sequence or by color. Use the other side of the cereal box to make a clock face. Make a set of dice from wood or cardboard or foam. Use these newly made pieces to show addition and subtraction. You can arrange the rocks from largest to smallest. Weigh the rocks and talk about the metric system. Add and subtract rocks while you work it out on paper or on a whiteboard. Let kids use multicolored dry erase markers when working on math problems. That's easy, right? This is much more conducive to creativity than just a black marker. So simple. Draw a number on the whiteboard in black and let the kids try to make a character out of the number using colored markers. Add eyes and legs and faces and see what they can come up with. Cut out geometric shapes from paper 
and have kids see if they can lay them out in the shape of an animal. Triangles and squares, think basic. Kids can practice tracing shapes and cutting them out as well, which develops their fine motor skills. I did this one on the back of a notepad. I didn't even take very much time doing it. But you could use scrapbook paper, you could have kids add colored paper, or do it on whiteboard and have them color them. If your kids are learning fractions, let them create a circle and cut it into slices like a pizza or a cake. Have them decorate it and then share pieces with you and their siblings. Talk about the portions they're serving in relation to the whole. Then you can bake a real cake and do the same thing. For older kids, it may be a simple matter of letting them do their work with colored gel pens rather than just pencil. They can add some jewel stickers to their calculator. Just let them know that it's okay to express their creativity even if they're studying algebra. If you don't have time to make all this stuff, you can buy them already made and still let kids use the products creatively in their own way. Wild animal counters can be used for counting and sorting and patterns and sequencing. Foam tangrams can be used to make animals and talk about geometric shapes and how they fit together. Pizza fraction fun game is a neat idea to give kids a visual representation of how fractions are used all the time. Pattern and sequencing books. This is a workbook for little kids with patterns to follow. Whiteboard crayons and Chisel Point Expo low odor markers setting the scene for creativity. So artist related to math, one popped into my head just right off the bat, Picasso in Cubism. He has this one of a horse and the, the front head is a triangle. Totally looks like something out of a Tangram's book. Eugène Boudin is an impressionist. He painted rocks at the seaside. So as you're painting those rocks to use as counters, there you go. Talk about Monsieur Boudin. Georges Seurat, when you're putting dots on those beans, talk about pointillism and how artists use dark dots to shade and white dots to highlight. Art itself. If you're looking for some straight up art instruction, there are several really good curriculum choices out there that will guide you in planning the lessons and how to present them. Courses are offered by grade level. You also get supply lists and a schedule to follow for the program. Here are some working definitions that may help you understand the various programs better. Art appreciation means that you can understand what it took to create a specific work of art from the conception of the idea to the execution of the piece. Art history, you'll learn about time periods of artistic style like Baroque, which is a style from the neoclassical period, or Surrealism, which is a style from the modern period. Art instruction, step-by-step -step teaching of how to produce a work using a specific media like painting a landscape using watercolors or a pencil drawing of objects using shading. Concepts include line, color, shape, pattern, texture, space, and composition. Technique, instruction specific to a media like shading and highlighting with charcoal pencils or color choice for effects in a collage applying oil paint with a palette knife versus a brush. Media, materials chosen to communicate the work of art, such as oil paints, watercolors, clay, marble, paper, etc. Tools are what you use to manipulate the chosen media, including brushes, sponges, carving tools, palette knives, cutting utensils. Color theory, think of the color wheel here. What colors are primary, secondary, or complementary? Why do some colors harmonize while others clash? Composition. How did the artist place the subject of his painting? How do objects relate to each other? Why was something chosen for the foreground or the background? Atelier is a program. Each level contains 18 lessons on three DVDs or modules and a parent-teacher manual in a binder. While the DVDs do most of the actual teaching, the parent-teacher manual arms the parent with complementary instruction, including lesson objectives and a list of materials, an outline procedure, and assessment information. Core art concepts like line, color, shape, pattern, texture, space, and composition are emphasized or reinforced in every lesson, along with experience in using different media and techniques. 
If you have multiple children similar in age, you can pick a level that fits their age range best and everyone can do art together. The program's pacing is up to you. Ultimately, the 18 lessons are designed for a year's worth of art. The parent-teacher manual suggests spending one hour per lesson at levels one through four, and an hour 15 minutes for levels five through eight. Meet the Masters is a program that's entirely online, one afternoon a month. Pre-assembled art supply bundles are available, which saves you time. Six units in each track, most of which focus on one artist. Tracks are intended to take a year to complete, with one artist taught per month. For example, track A includes a preview unit and the following artists, Van Gogh, Cassatt, Mondrian, Picasso, and Monet. There are three basic components, a slideshow presentation that introduces the artist, narrated by you with the help of printable PDF lesson, student packets to help students understand techniques used by those masters, and then art activities, which are projects based on those techniques. In this last portion of the lesson, your student will actually create a work of art similar to all or part of the masters, using the techniques that they've practiced. Your participation is essential as you will be demonstrating some of this. Fortunately, step-by-step -step instructions take you by the hand here, along with helpful illustrations, making your job all very clear and easy to follow. Artistic Pursuits the basic philosophy of artistic pursuits is to combine what it defines as the four essential categories of art into a short, easily manageable, and flexible lesson. These areas are elements of art, composition, media, and history. From a teaching standpoint, the lessons are very easy to use. In the senior high level, the emphasis is on European artists, and a few that are featured include Da Vinci, Raphael, Toulouse-Lautrec, Monet, Renoir, Picasso, Vermeer, Van Gogh, Cezanne, and Constable. The junior high level focuses on world art, while the upper elementary level examines American art. As mentioned previously, the early elementary levels cover art history from ancient to modern. Art with a purpose, these are art packs. They're convenient and easy to follow. Teacher instruction is included. Each pack covers a skill and uses easy to find art materials. How great though art are books and DVDs by Barry Stebbing. The book has 85 lessons for upper middle schoolers and high schoolers. For the younger grades, they use Lamb's Book of Art. Visual Mana works with multi-grade children at the same time, 45 lessons by the Jeffess family. Emphasis is on using recycled materials. They're user-friendly, cover a variety of projects, and it comes in loose-leaf form. Alpha Omega Art Life Packs cover a broad scope of topics in 10 student books with a teacher guide. It's independent for students, hands-on projects, and a variety of topics. If you prefer your art a la carte, not a full program, this would be a more free form type of art instruction. You can pick and choose from a large selection of books and videos, as well as the actual art materials. Even having some coffee table type books with beautiful photos of art around the house can be inspiring to a student and make them want to learn more about an artist or a period of style. Here are some book ideas. How to teach art to children, drawing for children, Chinese brush painting, a hands-on introduction. 365 things to make and do. Art ideas. Art. Great paintings. Osborne Book of Famous Paintings. And the Busy Teacher's Guide to Art Lessons for grades one through three. There's some videos too. Collage art for kids. Tricky video, a complete guide to making movie magic. Artist's special set of six DVD biographies about artists. And then there's the materials. Acrylic rhinestones, ancient paper, art start kit, art aroni tropical noodles, acrylic box set, acrylic handle brushes, Aline's tacky glue, air hardening clay in the one pound white, art first heavyweight drawing paper in nine by 12, construction paper, fade resistant, Wiki sticks, original pack neon. And then there's the other neat stuff. That's how I categorize it. A famous artist placemat. Through my eyes, artist masks. 
famous artist coloring books like Leonardo da Vinci or Monet. The artist in their time series, Dali or Gauguin, getting to know the world's greatest artist series like Renoir or Chagall. The Katie Art Appreciation Series is so cute. Katie and the British Artist and Katie Meets the Impressionist. Color your own series, Manet or Cezanne. Inspiration. Do you remember what the dictionary difference was between art and craft? Imagination. Art takes imagination. Something kids have no shortage of, right? Sometimes all it takes for kids to create art is to see the materials, have a space to work, and the time to come up with something. Art can be messy, there's no doubt about that, but it can be contained to one area. A place without carpet would be nice. A table is great. Shelves at kid level are awesome. It's what you put on those shelves that feed the imagination of the kiddos. Design your own art smock and put your child's name on it. Allow your child free art time. It's a wonderful thing to learn about famous artists and their techniques, but giving a child time to create original artwork is priceless. Messy, but priceless. Tell yourself that giving your child time to create original art is worth the effort it takes to clean it up. Make the cleanup part of the deal. Kids can pick up their own paper scraps or wipe down a table. They can certainly put crayons in a can and a coloring book on a shelf. Use shoe boxes as organizers and keep things in groups like toilet paper rolls in one, plastic caps and lids in another. There's a lesson in recycling here as well. Have a box for glue and tape and other sticky things and one for cutting tools like scissors and paper punches. Encourage the kids to put things back in their box with other like items. Paper should be kept flat and you can have a box for the scraps. Markers can stay in a coffee can that your child can decorate and have another one for the crayons. Keep your clay in a sealed container and paints where they're manageable for you. There will probably be things you don't want the kids to get into on their own and you can save those projects for your more formal art lessons. Set up a changeable art gallery with a string and clothespins or paper clips. Have your child decide on five items to display at any one time. Then they have to scrutinize their own work, which helps them look at their creations with a critical eye and edit them. They have to think about why they like one drawing better than another. Is it the colors, the subject, the composition. Occasionally ask your child about their gallery choices and have them explain how they came up with their ideas. So what do you think? Have you learned that you're already doing many of these things and just didn't think of it as art? Did you get some ideas that you can implement in your day? Did you decide that you're more of a free art type or a formal art instruction type? Can you see the elephant now?